We have a very interesting concept which we do to encourage entrepreneurship across the world, including India. And the idea is called as inspiring conversations. It has got nothing to do with real estate. The subject for real estate is over for the evening. What we want to discuss now is entrepreneurship and how we can encourage and motivate other entrepreneurs listening to such success stories of successful entrepreneurs. So it's a 20 minute session. We always choose an Indian entrepreneur in any part of the world so that Indian entrepreneurs back home and across the world get inspired by the success of another fellow Indian entrepreneur. So I would like to request Mr. Dakshesh Patel to join me on stage and it's a simple format. We are not discussing political life, personal life, spiritual life. The only life that we discuss is the entrepreneur's life. It is the anecdotes what made him successful, what helps him in taking decisions so that your unanswered questions can be answered by the guest of the show. Uh, today is our 32nd show and I would be very proud to say that in 32 inspiring conversations, not a single conversation has ever been repeated before. I am very privileged today that a very dear friend of mine who has been an ex-minister with the government of Maharashtra, we don't, inter uh, we don't interview politicians, we interview businessmen. So Mr. Prasad Lad was also one of the inspiring conversations, chief guest as an entrepreneur who employs more than 45,000 people. So I have with me Mr. Dakshesh Patel, he is a UK citizen but being an Indian origin we would like to interview him on our platform of inspiring conversations. Uh, Dakshesh Patel has a very interesting background, born Indian origin, born in Zimbabwe, uh, studied in Zimbabwe, did business in UK and couple of other countries. So we will take you through his journey and understand how entrepreneurship happens in this part of the world. So welcome Dakshesh and let's begin. So Dakshesh, that's been a very interesting journey for you uh, from being a banker, being employed in the banking industry, you got into the business mode in the last few years, a uh, decade or more and you utilized your banking knowledge to become an entrepreneur. What made you take the decision of becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, firstly, good evening everyone and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to, to explain myself and what I've been doing. I mean, as a banker, I think, you know, you have a responsibility uh, to society and I think 2008 was the defining moment when we had the financial crash and, you know, when you look back at that and you look at the excess and how we've forgotten society and our role in society and how important banking really is, uh, was a defining moment for me. Uh, and, and the step was really to come out of that and actually develop a payment service that looked at the unbanked sector particularly and, and find a solution that dealt with financial inclusion. When you decided your business plan, you defined your business spanning a couple of countries, some countries in Africa, now you are also concentrating on India. Uh, what made you decide those countries? What was the study that you did before you decided to venture into those countries for your business model? And what is your current business model? I think it, it started from a need um, and we started in Africa to begin with because Africa unlike anywhere else in the world, if you look at the remittance market, um, you know, globally there's something like $700 billion that travels between different countries. India is by far the largest. Um, the cost, just to give an example, into India is about 3 to 4 percent today. Africa is 12 percent. You know, so it's a super tax that the average person in Africa is actually paying. So that pain point is what we want to try and solve, that, you know, how do you remove that pain point of people that are earning decent livings, you know, living abroad, so migrants, diaspora, going to the Gulf, coming into Europe, working and just sending a simple living home. Their families that are destitute really need income because they don't have jobs um, and they're paying the super tax. And I think when you look at G20, G20's mission was that, you know, around the world, it should come down to 5% in the next five years. And so we wanted to start our journey in, in solving that particular problem. So Dakshesh is in the fintech services where he made sure that his banking knowledge gets converted into a business model with the help of technology. And he created an online platform connecting multiple countries and taking advantage of a pain that he saw in the industry which became his business opportunity. Uh, Dakshesh, when you started this, you were a man with accounting background. You brought technical expertise on board. Uh, when you made your business plan, what were the basic parameters that you put together to make sure that the journey that you are going to take on is the right one? I think you've got to have the right vision. 
uh, you've got to have the right problem that you're trying to solve. And I think the, the key for us when we started Zimpe was social consciousness. It was having that conviction and that belief that you could actually drive that change. And to, to do that, you know, like earlier in the panel we were talking about getting people joining from MNCs, why were they coming to a startup company, etc. And I think it's important that you how do we assemble a team that was actually going to um, deliver against this particular promise, if you like? Uh, so coming from banking itself, it was about trust to begin with. And it's that trust that you've got to build within the team they're trying to build uh, around you, if you like. So we start with four people, blank sheet of paper, and you need an enormous amount of patience. How did you make them believe in your vision? I think it was starting with that pain point, that, you know, that, that social value of what we're trying to deliver. And it was finding people that had the same mindset, if you like. It wasn't about making a fortune. It wasn't about making money at the outset. It was about how do we solve this particular problem. And what I did find very quickly was that, you know, conviction itself can bring the right people to you. You don't need to go look for them. They actually do find you. What is the risk analysis mechanism that you adapted before you started your enterprise? I think uh, the, the risk analysis was looking at the, uh, the market itself. So if, we, if we started in India, which is by far the largest market, probably it would have been a very difficult challenge to overcome. You know, very significant investment. Uh, if you take modern examples of digital India with Paytm, you know, to compete against juggernauts like that, you look at China with what Tencent, uh, WeChat and, and Alipay has done, you know, those are markets that, whilst they're very significant, we couldn't actually play in. But the one market we knew very well, having grown up there, having worked there, and having significant corporate relationships there, particularly in the banking industry, was Africa. And so for us, it was a very low barrier to cross, if you like. Um, the second challenge was actually dealing with the regulation. Um, and quite often, Africa is seen as a country where you can't venture, or a continent you can't venture. Difficulty with issues around corruption, how do you get through regulation? And strangely enough, we actually picked Zimbabwe as our first country because it actually met all the conditions for banking standards that exist here, exist in a country like that, which is quite difficult to understand and people to believe. The other reason we wanted to go there was that if you, if you could solve a problem in the most difficult country that the world doesn't want to do business with, then it's very easy to translate that anywhere else you go. Money movement has become very difficult, especially in the past two decades. Every, every dollar traveling any, any place across the world has been monitored very closely and pretty strictly. How do you ensure that all the rules and regulations that are required by various countries, depending on their geographical locations and their uh, DNA, how do you ensure that you are on the right side of law? Because in law, a mistake, even by mistake, is a mistake. So how do you ensure that your business practices unknowingly is not crossing any legal boundary? I think it's a very good question. I mean, when I started the company, uh, my CTO, who actually was born in Nigeria, uh, was already in the money transfer industry, if you like. And the first thing I remember saying to him was that the first system you build has to be KYC compliant. It has to look at animant money laundering. You have to be able to identify uh, point to point where the money is actually going and what it's actually being used for. And it's that second bit that is what the uniqueness is what we've built. Is that, you know, it's what I call purposeful remittance. So it's not about sending money to somebody. It was actually identifying what that money is actually being used for. So today, for example, you know, what we allow people to do is to actually pay someone's bills. So 30% of what people send is normally used to pay simple bills, whether it's utility, it's grocery, it's healthcare, it's schooling. And so what we did was to connect those particular supply points onto the platform, which meant that when you sent a payment, um, you would know exactly what that purpose was. And that's exactly the model we want to bring into India. There are two ways of quick growth for any entrepreneurship. One is adding more number of employees and sp expanding rampantly. Second is adding more vendors or uh, more partners and growing rapidly. Which route have you adapted and why? We, we actually have dotted the, the latter, you know, because... It, one thing I learned in banking is trust is the most fundamental feature when you're dealing with money. You know, people are trusting you with their funds. They're trusting you to actually get it to the point where it needs to get to. And you can only build trust through relationships. You know, it's not something that you can just overnight, just because you've got the best product, you've got the cheapest product, that people are going to buy that. You know, which is why if you look at the universal market, people still stick to the traditional lines of sending money. 
because there's a trust factor. So for us, that was fundamental. So we started with two of the largest institutions in Africa um, to actually build the business. And that's what's actually held us in a very good position to actually grow substantially. So you believe in partnerships? We do. Any business expansion news needs a very powerful review mechanism. What is yours? Well, the review starts with the um, standards that the corporate themselves, the partner, is setting on you. And you've got to adhere to those particular standards. It's very painful. Some can take up to two years, which is what's done. If I take South Africa as an example, just getting through the regulators has taken us two years. It's a very painful process, but a very necessary process because, you know, the more challenge you face and you emerge through the challenge, it becomes much easier. So pain at the beginning will bear fruits in the future. If you get fruits too early, you will see pain in the future. So we believe in that pain threshold. What inspires you for doing what you're doing? As I said, it's that community. It's that sense of giving uh, and that consciousness of actually making sure you're doing something that's going to benefit the people that need it most. So you believe in social entrepreneurship? Absolutely. And how do you communicate this through your business model? We communicate that through two, uh, three elements. It's sort of cost, convenience and control in the way we actually empower people to actually use the service itself. But we, what we are doing also is we've changed the business model and we're trying to prove to the community that there is an alternate way. Through use of technology, you can bring your cost of manufacture down. So in a typical manufacturing company, they will have raw materials that go into it. In a banking business, it's intellectual. So once you've built the platform and it's fit for purpose, your cost of manufacture can drop quite significantly if you like. So we've added a new cost to our raw material. And that's actually a sense of giving. So we are going to commit to give 10% of our revenue into a social foundation that will benefit education, health programs into the country where the money is actually flowing. So it's a new way of looking at uh, what is called corporate social responsibility. It's not responsibility in words and wisdom, but it's through actions of your fundamental business model. And that's how we intend delivering it. So friends, uh, Dakshesh, the business model that he conducts is a com company called Zimpe. And Zimpe is a very unique concept with zero competition across the world, where money can travel from one country to the other country and can be used for paying utilities like education, medical, light bills, water bills, all kind of utility services can be paid. So a son working in London can earn in London and pay, some, to pay his family bills in India seamlessly and effortlessly irrespective whether the family in India has a bank account or not. So the money can reach even to people who don't have a bank account back home in any country. It might be somebody working in London and uh, staying in Zimbabwe, it can happen. Uh, this is a very interesting business model where you are not having any competition. What according to you is competition? Does it help your growth or having competition is good or not having competition is good? What do you think about competition? I think competition is always um, healthy and it's more about um, collaboration, if you like. So even companies that um, will enter the space. So we quite often get um, you know, benchmarked against how do we stack up with Western Union, Asimo, World Remit, the new sort of digital remittance companies, if you like. And, and our view is very simple, is that you know, people must be given the choice. It's not up to us to determine what people want. Our role is to ensure that we provide the services that people want. And competition's healthy because it keeps you, it keeps that tension, it keeps us at the sort of cutting edge and make sure that we keep thinking, we keep delivering uh, against that particular promise. Since your enterprise is growing on partnerships and collaborations, what are your recent experiences in terms of your insights of collaborative working? Because a lot of people are very averse to collaborative working. So what can be your insights which can motivate people for growing through collaborations? I think it's, uh, you, you've got to take it country at a time and culture at a time. You know, if I took India, India was a very interesting journey for us, you know, because um, coming to India, you can have a conversation that seems left, but the thinking of the corporate is right. So you never know whether actually what you're saying and they're nodding in a room, whether they're in agreement with you or whether they're just taking in knowledge, if you like. And I think it's, you, you've got to take certain risks in, in your business model. When we went to Nigeria, it's very similar. And there, the cultural fit is you've got to think like a Nigerian to do business like a Nigerian. You know, when you're going to India, it's more about the responsibility that the corporate is actually laying. You know, their own reputation is quite fundamental. Um, so for India, for example, the sector we looked at was healthcare. And, you know, we see healthcare as a very significant growth area in India. It's the fastest growing market, probably globally. It's growing at 30% a year. 
uh, and the big uh, buzz in India today is medical tourism. Um, today in India it's $4 billion. In three years it will be $8 billion. And there's very significant growth um, that's coming through. The marriage we're bringing is our expertise in Africa. Because the biggest channel of growth into India for medical services is from Africa. And how is that happening? It's much like the real estate discussion we had um, earlier, if you like, with wealth comes affluence, with affluence comes choices. So we are spoilt as creatures of habit, if you like. And so what's happening in Africa is this renaissance that as people are becoming more affluent in the middle class, they're demanding better services, whether it's education, it's health. And India provides that solution um, to sort of the new Africa, if you like. And our role in that was actually solving the payment problem, that how do you get that payment from Africa into India? And what we've done in the case of Nigeria, for example, and into India with the largest health provider, uh, Apollo Group, is to actually arrange for their patients to pay in their home country for service in a foreign country. So the analogy I use um, in, in the way we're setting it out is imagine rivers going into an ocean. So rivers all have their own challenges, they have their own tributaries, they have their own way in which they meander, but ultimately when they hit the ocean, they're one with the ocean. They lose their identity, they're one. So for us, payments is the same thing. It doesn't matter where you are and what you do. If you want to make a payment, you should have the right to do it wherever you are, whenever you want. Decision making is a constant process for any entrepreneur and every entrepreneur. That is the only work that he does in business. How do you ensure that the decisions that you have taken are vetted by the key people and what instigates you to take the next decision? I mean, decision making is a difficult um, setup, particularly in a startup. Do you have a sounding board? I do. And, and the sounding board for us is a, a set of senior advisors that we use, you know, um, and we tend to have specialists in every sphere. And it's not just um, legal, it will be regulatory, it will be payments, it will be business management, it will be relationship building. And so each facet of this area, emerging markets, uh, we have an advisor that actually helps us. It's my conscience. And so, you know, that is the place where we would go and I would have a conversation. Uh, much like this, throw an idea and you'll either get shot down or it'll go forward, if you like. Secondly, it's the people within the company itself. So being a startup, it's, it's fascinating how you, you bring a blend of people that come from different backgrounds and different levels of experience, if you like. In a big corporate, as I was in a major bank, you've got the shelter of committees, you've got the shelter of making mistakes, you know someone's going to catch you. When you come into an entrepreneur business, you don't have that parachute. You know, so you will make mistakes, you will fall, but it's actually, if you've got the conviction and you've got the vision, then you will rise, but you'll see through that challenge. Too many entrepreneurs, I find, you know, in, in, in our position, if you like, give up too early. You know, they want that magic bullet because you read that story of how fintechs are, you know, accelerating in valuations, how they're getting insane investment being put into them, etc. Uh, and, you know, crossing that chasm means that you've got to go through that, th that pain threshold. You've got to be consistent and you've got to have that passion to see through that problem. Business is all about people management and people are the best assets to have. At the same time, they are the most complicated assets to manage. So how do you recruit? How do you train? How do you retrain? And how do you retain? That's a very good um, question. Um, recruitment is always the difficult bit. And I think the easiest thing I would recommend to any entrepreneur is start with people you know. People that trust you that have worked with you before. Um, and when you start right at the beginning, you know, you're starting with a blank sheet of paper, it takes a huge amount of faith for someone to step away from the comfort zone of having a monthly salary, a monthly payroll coming through, and joining a startup where you're completely uncertain where your next bread is going to get buttered, essentially. And so, you know, that conviction comes from having that initial trusted relationship with two or three people um, that are coming with you that believe in your vision, uh, if you like. As how the, do you train them? One is recruit, then how do you re train them? I think the training is, um, as, as the leader of the organization, you're playing multiple roles, and you've got to step down to their particular role. Down meaning you've got to do the work yourself, uh, and you've got to show by example. Um, so whether it's doing the accounting, it's actually making the tea, it's actually setting up operations, explaining you know, maybe 20 times how anti-money laundering works, you know, you've got to show that patience because not everyone is at that same level, you know, because you've got subject matter experts within 
a company, if you like, and those that join you, and they're quite used to what they've been doing before, and you've got to change that mentality, and that's a big challenge. So that's, so the failure is not the individual, the failure is in the leader not being able to inspire their staff. How do you ensure that you retain them? Because this talent can move with your technology, with your ideas, including your customers, and there goes your business. How do you ensure that you retain them? Have fun. I think, you know, with everything, you've got to strike a balance. And, you know, we're all social animals. How do you balance that having fun? Because if they do it overboard, it impacts the business. So how do you ensure it's balanced? I think you strike a balance. You know, you, you celebrate even small successes uh, that people have. It's identifying the little things that people do, uh, if you like. So an example I'll give you, uh, just the other day, uh, we had a, um, an issue that arose with the service partner that, that had gone down and the service wasn't working. And the operations person took it upon herself to actually ensure she called our top 10 customers to let them know. Now that's an initiative you don't train people on. You know, that just comes from your own passion in what you're doing, if you like. And they do that, why? Because they can see that every facet, you know, every person takes their personal role with, with personal pride, that it's their own responsibility, it's their own business. So, you know, never do we sit there and say, this is my business, I'm the owner. You know, that never comes up. It is our business. And I think the day your employees, your staff, your partners treat something as their own, you know, that's when you're going to move forward. You are in the technology space. Technology changes with every blink. How do you ensure that you are ahead of what you are doing? How do you ensure your learning curve? And how do you make sure that you are retraining your people who are already trained? I think that's, um, that, that's something that we stay alive to every single day. I mean, the business we in in payments, there's a change every single day. You know, you only have to, and, and I get reminded that by my shareholders. So we have a, a great bunch of strategic angels. And every time something hits Bloomberg, hits the FT, or something's happened in India or in China, you know, I get to know about it. And then they expect a response within two days on what we're going to do to respond to that particular challenge. How will you put it in the line of priority? Shareholder, customer, teammates? I think shareholders are fundamentally your friends. Um, you know, they've, they've trusted you with their funds. In a startup company, they're going with your passion. Your business model is a piece of paper. So what they're buying into is an idea. And they're buying into your your ability to convert that idea into execution. And you are going to have pitfalls. There will be moments when there are great disappointments, but there will also be moments when you succeed. And I think it's identifying your early investors have to be ones that have very patient capital to play with you. Uh, because it's not going to be a smooth ride at the beginning. It's going to be extremely rough. You know, it's like sitting in a hurricane, almost, if you like. When it comes to customers, I think customers... So are first is shareholders. First to shareholders, in terms of starting the journey of your business, is identify the right shareholder that's going to give you that sort of step up. And shareholders is not just your friends and family, it's actually strategic. So starting a business in a, in a market that's very mature, as banking and payments is, that you've got to be that one step further ahead. And having those strategic investors as angels coming in at the beginning is quite important, uh, if you like. Customers become fundamental at the point you want to start rolling your product out. You know, and what they say is 100% gospel. Whether they're right or wrong, it's irrelevant. They are correct at all times. And the company has to adjust to what your customer is actually saying to you, uh, if you like. If they're wrong, be polite and actually make them understand why something is not the way it should be, um, if you like. But most fundamental between those two points is your staff. And your staff are your crown jewels. And they will hate you. As a chief exec, you know, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, uh, in their business, you know, because you've got this dual role of responsibility, upward and downward, if you like, you know, people will hate you because you need a job done. You know, as Shakespeare will say, sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. And it's not cruel in a meanful way. You know, and, and, and the test of any leader is that you can have a very tense conversation with a member of staff, but within five minutes, if you can then also crack a joke, you've struck that balance. My last question to you is, what is goal setting to you, and how do you make sure you achieved it in time? And after that, I'll open the questions to the house. We'll take five questions and conclude for dinner. 
I think goal setting is, uh, I mean, you've got the business school idea of saying you set a plan and you set a financial vision of where you want to get to. Yeah. Um, goal setting is always interesting. You know, if you take a business school approach, then it's a financial model that you're going to run uh, in terms of what you're trying to do. For, for me, it's quite different. The goal setting was more about what's the values you're trying to create? What's the, what's the change you're trying to bring? not just the industry, but the society that we want to actually represent uh, itself. I started by talking about social consciousness, and for me, that's more fundamental, that we get that balance right. And the reason I say that is that if you've got the right... Um, if you've got the right purpose and the right values uh, embaked in terms of what you're trying to achieve in the long term, if you like, then all you've got to focus on is what's the action I need to take today. It's not about the result. It's about what action you're taking today, because the result will come from just the work that you're doing. But if you focus on the results, you, you may just miss the point. You lose your concentration. And the example I'll give you is, you know, we talked about Sachin earlier this evening, and I'll give you the analogy of cricket, um, if you like, and saying you're batting out there, you're 99. So is your mindset on getting to 100, or is it just I continue batting? Because that's what I'm doing. And it is most likely that the person who's thinking, the batsman thinking about getting to 100, will get out. Because he's thinking of the results, not focusing on his action. So, in setting a goal, you know, you know where you want to go, you know what your journey is, um, and as long as you're performing the action you need to today, you will achieve that goal. And you believe in course correction as the journey goes on? Correct. Friends, questions. Five questions and we break for dinner. Um, can you hear me, yeah? Thank you very much. I, I love the way you ask the questions. Incredible. Um, and the answers. I mean, in terms of the company, I'm very impressed with the way I, I'm actually also working in the financial services with startups. Uh, and TransferWise was one of my main player. Um, question to you. When you, look at, when you looked at starting your own company, in the UK market, did you raise any funds or was it more through networks, angel investors? That was one. Like in, in terms of actually getting the investment, what is the right time? Was it when you launched the product or when it, at the start of the project? And the second one uh, finishes, can you, you talked about like you got challenges as well as uh, good things. In the early stages, has there been anything that you felt like, you know, I had enough, I have to give up? And how did, if you had that, how did you actually recover? Yes. Both very, very good questions. I think, let's start with the investment question. I think it's, 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 it's the cycles that you go through. Any investor looking at you as an entrepreneur will want to see, you know, you always hear this question, have, what skin in the game have you got, you know, and are you taking risk? And the idea we all start by saying, well, actually, I'm not taking a salary, and say, so, well, that's not painful, you know, because that's a decision that you take, not to take a job and actually start an idea, if you like. So the risk is really your time, rather than real value. And, and so the first lesson always, uh, they would get asked that, you know, what is the step you're taking to put tangible risk on the table, if you like? And I think that's a bit where you've got to decide whether it's going to be a long gestation or a short gestation. So it really depends on your idea and what you're trying to do, if you like. So even if you look at a company like Uber, Uber started in 2009. You know, it's taken them nine years, almost, to get to the point that they're at. And people forget that at the beginning, they were just another humble company, like any other startup, if you like. And they've grown very, very rapidly. So the stage of investment is that you've got to first take that step uh, itself. And if you have the fortunate element of having friends or relationships that have got deep pockets that are willing to back your idea, because they like who you are, they trust you, and they're willing to take that step. And, you know, that's the step that we took. I had a few vague friends that decided to come together and put a bit of capital up. But it's then what you do with that capital that's really important. But you began with your own capital. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So you've got to start with your own capital uh, behind the idea itself. And what we then feel is to actually invite angels, or strategic angels, into the business, if you like. And there are two types of businesses, if you like. One which is where you've got the idea as an entrepreneur, but you don't have the relationships. You know, in terms of whether they're corporate, they're strategic. And in those circumstances, you want to go to a venture capitalist quite early, which actually raise the required capital. It's not about the money, it's more about their relationships and their guidance and their mentorship to get you through that next stage of getting that first anchor partner or that corporate customer 
to actually use your service, whatever that idea is, uh, if you like. Um, if you don't, but where you have come from background, you know, we're fortunate, I've come from the banking industry, and so having those relationships meant that I could open doors to get to those strategic partners, like big insurance companies that we now work with, Old Mutual, Sandlam, Prudential, uh, and now Apollo Hospitals Group, if you like. And that's come from relationship building, if you like, and that trust is established because of that. When you're doing that, then your investment is much more around your strategic investors that you want in the business, because you're trying to grow strategically. It's not about how quickly you can gain as many customers as you want, uh, if you like. You know, that's where the VC route is, is a sensible route. But it has its pitfalls and it has its positives, if you like. So if you took TransferWise as an example, you know, it grew phenomenally because it came from a social digital background to begin with. But what they did very quickly was bring on board people like Richard Branson. So they got on people that could build that trust very, very quickly. And so it gave them that muscle to actually grow in a market that was very, very crowded. Now that's not the market that we're trying to focus on ourselves because it is, it is a very difficult market to try and break into. Um, the second aspect was um, in terms of... So basically you brought on strategic investors who not only gave you money but they also give you business opportunities. Correct. Yeah. And that is a better investor to have for any entrepreneur. That's the long term. That's it the long... But right. it's also the immediate benefit as well. It is. Because yeah. he gives in money and he brings in business as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he brings in significant business if you like. Uh, so, for example, you know, for, for Zimbed, it's early stage, being a very small company, we've signed an Africa-wide deal with Old Mutual Group. So every country that they operate in, we will, their, we will be their payment service partner. So immediately when you look at strategic partners like that, it makes investment a lot easier. Um, but it will take time. You know, nothing is going to happen very, very quickly. And so you've got to make a decision whether you, your idea is going to need a long period of gestation. If it does, you need very deep-pocketed investors that are willing to see you through that cycle. If your idea is something that will turn revenue very, very quickly, then it's much more to do with strategic partners that will help you scale. Because when you scale, you need their support in order to uh, rapidly put uh, the, the appropriate operation in place um, to support your business, if you like, uh, in terms of what it is. That's that. That's a good question, good answers. Any more questions? Yes. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, I really enjoyed, uh, and especially uh, I have uh, followed Rajesh for a long time. Uh, sir, uh, being an entrepreneur is very challenging, and it's like 24-7, we can't take a break. And how do you manage your work and your personal life, and what is your, how do you schedule your day? Thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, being an entrepreneur means that you never really sleep at the beginning. You know, because you are constantly um, have this mind thought of actually what you're trying to do. Um, but I have a habit, I have one simple thing, and I love movies. And for me, to switch off, I go and watch a film. And in those three hours, you know, I've completely switched off. I'm not really thinking about business, not thinking about work at all. Uh, and it's my way of sort of switching off. Even my wife will tell me that, you know, this is, you know, that's your way of just switching off, basically, is just sit and watch a film, if you like. I've had the benefit of having a family that's actually been very, very supportive um, through the journey, if you like. It's not been an easy journey. It's clearly, with a lot of the travel, we're trying to build a global business. It means that, you know, you are, I'm going to be on a plane more regularly than other times, if you like. And so I'm going to be away uh, from family, if you like. Um, if I had a very young family, I would think again uh, in terms of trying to strike that family and life balance and, and work balance, if you like. Uh, mine are much older. Uh, they're sort of teenagers, you know, that one's just finished university, for example. Um, and my wife's decided to take a sabbatical. She's actually studying in India. Uh, she's doing the Vedanta philosophy at the academy. And so, you know, we've started, what we did was to bring that into our business model itself. So when I'm traveling, I will, we will connect in different parts of the world, uh, if you like, uh, in terms of building that business. But I think, you know, the important thing is to ensure that you don't forget that you have responsibilities and duties, not just in building your business or being an entrepreneur, but also with your family and your loved ones. And it's getting that balance right. Fantastic. The next question, please. I want to understand leadership in one word. 
from your work experience and whatever you have gained through your uh, changes uh, in workspace? She wants to leadership understand. Leadership in Le one word. Leadership in one word. Wisdom. Okay. Thank you, friends. That was very nice of you all to participate in this event. And uh, I'm thankful to Dakshay. She was pretty quick and hands-on in what he's doing. And probably that is the reason of his success. Uh, so tomorrow when Zim, uh, Zimpe becomes a global leader, which it is already today, because there is no competition anyways, as you grow taller, we'll be happy that we witnessed this event with you this evening in London. So congratulations and we wish you all the best. Thank you.